Uh, hello everyone. Uh, we are Hector and Roger uh, from uh, from the Polygon. We are currently working on Polygon GKBM. Uh, I don't know why that we are supposed to be like the Spanish mafia. I don't know why we got this name. To be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and the idea of this talk is, uh, well, to explain a little bit uh, the tracks that we are going to be offering during this GK hack. Uh, specifically, we both are going to be explaining like the e-star verifier, which I will say is like the cryptographic option of the two entries that we have. And then we'll have, uh, we'll have Brian in the, in the Plonky3 tool stack, which is probably much more generic. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, well, let's start with the basics. Uh, I'm sure that most of the people in this room know what is a GKBM, what is a, a GK rollup, and all this stuff. But if just one person doesn't know what it is, I think this slide will be worth it. Okay, so I, as you can see in the slide, uh, I like to summary a uh, GK rollup as uh, an application that lives uh, between two layers, layer two and layer one. I'll, uh, I think I, I, I like to say that layer two is like the execution layer and layer one is like the verification layer. And the main idea of, of a rollup, uh, well, basically users send transactions on the layer two. Okay, then these transactions somehow get rolled up into a single transaction in L1. So you can imagine this as having a bunch of transactions in L2 that's, that gets compiled down to a single transaction in L1. And well, that, that will be like the optimistic part of the GK rollup. But if you want to add GK to a GK rollup, then somehow you have to generate a validity proof of what you're doing is actually correct and valid. Okay? For example, you cannot send a negative number of uh, coins from one account to another one and all these uh, invalid operations. So basically, uh, when we compute, when we, let's say when we group these transactions in a batch, what we do is we generate a proof of the validity of such transactions, okay? And the layer one is called like the validity layer because this proof uh, is verif verified on a smart contract on layer one, okay? So users and transactions to layer two and the proof gets verified on layer one. Thank you. Okay, going a little bit more in the details, what actually happens when a user sends a transaction to L2 is that, as, as, you, might, as you might know, uh, a transaction can be expressed as a set of opcodes, of EBM opcodes. Okay? And what we do, well, the, first option, the first option that we had is uh, we could generate a proof of the, we could generate directly a proof of the validity of these opcodes, of the EBM opcodes. But as you might, as you might know, uh, the EBM was not designed to be GK friendly, okay, which means that the set of all codes in the EBM are not that easy to prove. Okay, so the idea was to design our own set of opcodes. Okay, this is what we call the ZK opcodes. Okay, and in fact, when we get the set of all codes of a transaction, we transpile this set of all codes to our, uh, our own set of all codes. Okay, and then we basically prove or generate a proof of this. Let's say that the equivalent program with, with our own set of all codes instead of the original one. Okay, so basically the ZKBM gets fed as an input the list of tailor-made uh, all codes that we have. Then we have the EBM program. Okay, basically uh, we enforce that the ZKBM only can, let's say, follow the EBM program and not any other program. And then we generate a proof that not only that the, the, the single uh, GK opcodes of every transaction are correct, but also that they follow the correct logic. Okay? Theoretically speaking, uh, the, the EBM program is hard coded in the GKBM, okay? which means that theoretically uh, you could substitute this program with any other program okay? and convert the GKBM uh, to a ZKVM. Okay? So you can extract the Ethereum from the question. Okay, uh, so going even deeper into the details, uh, the design of the ZKBM is not, a, is not like a, a super complex and, and, and a super complex uh, processor, but we decided to the divide, so we decided to do like the, 
divide and conquer option, and we divided the logic into multiple components. Okay? So, for example, uh, we have uh, the EBM has uh, all codes of, uh, let's say, of very, very different flavor. For example, we have arithmetic operations, there are binary operations, there are memory operations. Okay? And what we did was to design a, a specific a coprocessors for each, a, let's say, set of common opcodes. Okay, so for example, as you can see in the, in the image, we have a processor that deals with arithmetic opcodes. We have another one uh, that deals with binary opcodes. For example, we have a very specific one that uh, proves the validity of uh, SHA-256 uh, opcodes in the, in the EVM, for example, when you verify um, uh, transactions. Okay, and, and then we also have the memory, we have the program, and we have the idea was to design it in a very in a in a very modular manner, in the sense that generating a proof, or better said, uh, arithmeticize the problem of proving the validity of a of a EBM uh, would be uh, like super easy. Okay, so uh, yeah, these are the two bounties that we have. Okay, we are we, as I said before, we are going to be focusing on explaining how we have implemented our verifier. Okay, and the idea uh, does not deal with uh, the proving to the extent that we have, but the idea of the bounty is to be able uh, to re-implement our verifier, uh, not as we are gonna be explaining, not how, how we have done it, which is what we are gonna be explaining right now, but uh, the idea is to implement a new processor Okay, so it's like adding a new processor to the previous diagram that specifically computes the verification part, the verification part of our circuit. Okay, we are very curious about the numbers that we could get by doing it directly as compared to how we have done it. Okay, that's right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what is e Stark? Uh, so for those familiar with e Stark, this challenge will be I will say quite straightforward, okay? Because ESTARC is the name for our proving system. So, basically, what you have to do is to implement the verifier of this proving, the proving system, and the E that is extra in the star name is basically, uh, let's say that we, we have, well, we, that's, let's say that what we have done is adding a new set of arguments to the star proving system, okay? So, basically, if you are able to understand what is a Stark. So you for sure we will be able to understand what is fry. Uh, it should be easy or more or less easy to implement the verifier within our tool stack. So I'm gonna jump and I will try to explain first how we verif currently verify the Starks and then what's our proposal that could be another way, way to implement it that might be more efficient. So, uh, um, Basically, we use two, two uh, languages. One's Circom, the other one's Spill. Both of us are in-house languages. Uh, Circom is probably more extended because it's been in the web space since 2018 or so. Uh, Pill is more new. Uh, this is um, just a small spoiler. We are working on a mu much uh, bet uh, second version of the language, but this is not the topic of uh, this talk. So, what we do right now, um, we, the idea is that we use recursion in uh, our CQVM so we can prove in multiple batches uh, with a single proof that's then sent on chain. And to do that, we need to be able to verify Starks so we can then aggregate them together. So the way we do it is we originally ro uh, wrote a Stark verifier in Circom, which uh, then we will show you, I uh, will do a bit of uh, live through, through the code and we can show you where you can find it, but um, that will come later. And so, and we, we implemented it in Circom and we, what we saw is that it was um, a bit expensive. So the number of constraints of that verifier was, uh, too mu was way too much, so we didn't fulfill our, pur uh, our purpose because uh, it was too expensive to then aggregate and it, it wasn't worth it. So what we came up with is we, okay, so let's use, let's use custom gates. Because then we know that there's some parts of the verifier that, uh, can, that are repetitive or, or that can, we, can be um, split in a separate, in a separate, uh, in a separate uh, part. We can verify it apart. 
Um, but the problem is that uh, Circom allows you to write custom gates, but you cannot verify it. Because uh, as you probably know, custom gate, um, we, can, um, we can do the, compu with Circom we can do the computation, but we cannot prove that uh, the, the correctness of, that, of, the, of, the, of the code you're writing. So we needed to find a way, okay, it's, it's fine because with uh, custom gates we can, um, we can reduce a lot the number of constraints of the verifier itself, but then we need to, because for example, we have a Poseidon custom gate, which basically means that we simply have the input of the Poseidon and the output of the, of the, of the Poseidon, but then, then we will need to verify that that Poseidon was uh, properly cal calculated. And then, we, okay, it was, okay, so now we have, um, we add custom gates, the numbers look uh, much, much better, but now we need to find a way to, to um, prove it. And so what we did is we went through a bit of a long path but uh, taking advantage of, of, P, of PIL, that basically our ZKVM was uh, written in PIL, we said, okay, so we, if we can transpile that, that circum to, P, to PIL, we will be able to generate, to validate the correctness of, the, of verify the, the correctness of those, constraint, of, of those custom gates in PIL. So basically what we do is we, we, have, we had the stack verifier, we had the custom gates, and now that, they are, that we have this, we can uh, transpile we, we, that, that R1C, the R1CS of the circum circuit um, to uh, PIL. And then in PIL, we can write the, um, we can, we can write the verification of those custom gates. But as you can see, we're doing like a quite a long path because we're, we're going from circum to PIL and then we will go back to circum when we verify the next start. And what we started thinking is, okay, so maybe this is not necessary. Maybe we can, with PIL itself, we can write the whole verifier. And uh, in the same uh, modular uh, way uh, Hector was explaining that uh, in this game we have like se separate components, we can split uh, the verification like se in, in some different models that we will see right, I think in the next slide, but I'm not sure about that. Yeah. So. Uh, on the right side, you can see like ZKVM, we have like the arithmetic, uh, the binary, the padding, uh, several different um, uh, models. So we thought, okay, we, we, we can probably do the same with the verifier, but uh, with uh, different ones. Like for example, Fry can be a, a, a model. Um, the FFT, uh, the evaluations, uh, Poseidon, there's like many pieces that you can start breaking the verifier down into these small pieces and, uh, and create uh, small processors that then make, they can add all together and form a verifier. But as you can see, like there, uh, for example, Fry is like, you could have a, a coprocessor that, ver that verifies Fry that's completely independent. It, it, it serves for a purpose, but all are like small pieces that they will all add up together. And yeah, you can move on. So I think that that's the idea, that hopefully it's more or less clear, that why, and the motivation, I hope it's clear, like why, the, why, the way we're doing it and what we're proposing that would be a cool alternative, because also you would be diving into Peel, that's uh, our language, and I think that the best way to, for, for us for, to get introduced to that, we will show you uh, an example, and we'll do a bit of a walkthrough through uh, a code. Yeah, if you scan the QR code, it will guide you to a GitHub repo where we place the example, and this is what we are going to be explaining now. Okay, the idea basically show, show, showcase the, our tool stack, what, what you'll need to build the star verifier, uh, at least to give you a sense of how we have done it for the ZKVM. Okay, so we have divided, we typically divide the, the when we have to define an arithmetization in between two repos. In the components repo, you will have the logic, not only for the arithmetization of each component, but also the executor of each component. Okay, basically the executor is the logic that fill up the execution, execution trace for this particular component. And then uh, in the source code, uh, you will have, you will find all, all the logic let's say, uh, gluing all the components all together 
generating the entire computational trace and generating the proof, verifying the proof, generating the recursive part, and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's start with the basics. Okay, so uh, the idea of this example is a very, very basic chip. Okay, it's a chip that uh, only performs a particular operation. Okay, so we will see like the main logic of the chip and then we'll see how this, let's say, when the chip has to perform this particular operation, it will tell the other component or it will ask the other component to perform and to verify this particular oper operation. Okay, it's like a, I will say it's like a enhanced version of a Fibonacci, a typical, a traditional Fibonacci example. Okay, so in the, co in, in, in the components, uh, for each folder in the components, you will have like the arithmetization logic and the executor. Okay, the arithmetization is written in, in PIL. We have to make it bigger. So if okay. you're familiar with Fibonacci, I mean, you can see here like the first part of the, of the main, you're simply verifying a Fibonacci, a Fibonacci sequence, where basically we can go a bit more detail if you want, uh, but probably you are, you've seen this if you've played around, like it's the basically hello world of, uh, of, GKB, uh, of GKBMs. Yes, okay, so... Uh... Basically, what we, we what we do here is to define the, let's say, like, like the design of the computational trace. We have the columns A and B. Uh, we have the public inputs of the Funaki sequence, and we have uh, some set of con constraints checking that the public inputs are being introduced correctly to the computational trace. And then, when we have to, uh, let's say that when we have to perform the particular operation, okay, which is not still speaking a Funaki in addition. Uh, uh, with the syntax, what we are doing here is we are um, uh, sending, let's say, this operation uh, to, be, to be checked for the other component, which is what we call the module component. Okay, so this is a very, very simple logic. And then, in the module component, in its arithmetization, we have the actual check that, the, that this particular operation is being done correctly. Okay, so basically what we are doing here is a modular division. Okay, so basically we check that the question and the remainder computed are, are, are done correctly. Okay, so then in the, well, I'm sorry because we have done it, we have done it, uh, we have done it everything in JavaScript. Okay, just for being as fast as possible. But here you have the logic filling up the, the particular computational trace for this component. Okay, so for example, here uh, we are computing the question or the reminder for each of the inputs that are being received by the main component. Okay, and otherwise uh, we fill uh, the trace with dummy values to, so that the constraints are being satisfied. Okay, this is for the module component. We have the very same logic for the main component. And then so basically, uh, like just to, summar to summarize it, so we have like, if you see like components folder, so we have, uh, we have uh, a pill file and then we have the corresponding executor, which basically uh, when we, um, there's the pill file that is the one we've just shown you and then when we write the executors, uh, if I can go back one second to that. There's the, um, you, you can build the constants on one side and, and, and the committed polynomials on the other side. But that's the only thing you need to do to be able to generate a proof. So once you write, we have written the, the uh, PL, PL uh, file and, the, and its ex executors, everything else, there, uh, there's a trade, uh, you can run a set of, com of uh, command lines. We will show you, we will show you now uh, what, what those commands are and you can generate a proof and verify it. And so probably easiest way, can I? I will sh I will show it. A bit. I don't want to to bore you a lot because if I start like coding, you as said before by Rizzo, you will go to Twitter. That's what I usually do. So let does me open. If not, if not, that's fine. I will. Cool. So then I'm gonna open the packages. And I'm sorry, that's in JavaScript because. Uh, 
usually for that that's what we use, we use for uh, to speed up development it's you can do any uh, we have uh, our production code is in c++ and moving to rust but usually we find javascript that's easier because it's uh, less trick language uh, it's probably not as good but it speeds up the development process so if i open the package json and let me close this you can see here there's like a bunch of uh, comments but basically the one i'm going to focus is in test main as you can see there's a, a set a set of uh, comments you need to run in order that that will generate the proof so if i go briefly through it Firstly, we generate the, we run the executors, so we, so we generate a, a commit file and a const file, and once we have that, you also you will need to define a start struct. I'm assuming that you are all more or less familiar with how start works. Basically, a start struct is a config, a very simple config file that defines some bytes that are needed to, in order to generate the start proof. In our case, we basically have uh, the number of bits, uh, the, the extension, uh, how the how many the extension and the fry steps, and the number of queries for the for, for verifying fry. And basically, that's it. You just need to write the pills, write the executors, and then you just run. In this case, test main, but you can see the comments are the same. You just you simply have to change files if you have if you are pointing to different directories but you can generate a proof out of the box. So I, I will run it and I can show you the logs. That and also like, in fact, all of this, as you can see, generating a proof, it's verifying, verification succeeded and, and a circum was generated. In fact, that's not even necessary. Because what we ha if if we check the logs, you will see that there's the third uh, option, the, 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 the third command line. Let me see if I find it here. There's pill verify. So basically, we, ha we have uh, we have a, a program that uh, given a, a pill and a, a commit file and a constant file, we can automatically check if if the pill if if, if the file if the commit files. Uh, a, uh, fulfill the, 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 con the constraints. So if, uh, uh, in this case, we can see if, it su if this succeeds, you can, you can also generate a proof, but that should not be needed because it, it would be uh, generated. It, it should succeed. So it's, you just need to see that the verification succeeded in order to know that the proof will be valid. And in this repo, we've also added uh, our current um, Verifier. I, you can see here in sources or what? Okay. There's a circum verifier example, and this is what I was explaining before. We have um, the main, main circum. Wait, let me close this. Which you can go through it. It's uh, a bunch of code, but at the end, uh, there's like s separate components, like for example, all this part is basically generating the transcript, uh, where generating the, trans the transcript for the Stark. Uh, there's another function that what does is verify the, verify the fry. And so there's like uh, five or six uh, main components. And what I said before that right now, and that's why we are encouraging you to like try to rewrite it in Peel, is that there's like some um, custom gates, and that's why we need to generate the PI, the pill that for example here you will see that in this case we have uh, that's that's a uh, Poseidon is a bit more tricky so let me find an easier one this one for example so basically uh, every time we we uh, the verifier operates in the extend in the extended field we simply uh, say that there's a custom gate there so we will just um, so the circum will not verify anything. We'll just store the input of the, the two values that you are, you are multiplying and the output. And then we will send that to, uh, we will pass this to, to Peel. And you can see here that from line 637 to like 
654. Basically, what we're doing is we are in PIL, the, we, are write, we are writing how a uh, uh, multiplication in the extended field will look like, and we are checking that, that, that given the two inputs and that, that we do the operation and we check that this matches with the output that Circum said that, okay, I've not, I've not checked it, but this should be the correct one. So if, if you can check that if, if you do it on Circum, maybe there's like a thousand constraints, and here it's just a simple check that uh, this will, that, that the constraint fulfills, which is much cheaper, and at just one row. And I think that's pretty much it. If we will be around for the whole for the whole day, probably, feel free to ask any questions. If you want to know more, if you are if you have questions about the about Peel, about Circum, about ZKBM, about about the, if you maybe are interested in recursion, about what we're doing, we're here to try. To, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Look to you. Yeah, look to you. Uh, for sure, we are not asking you to uh, let's say re all the all the part in this uh, in this part with the custom gates. But instead, what we are asking to you is to translate some of the parts in the logic of this uh, main verifier from circum to peel. Okay, and I will say that the hardest part is the fly logic part. Okay, assuming, I mean, assuming that you do not know how fly works, you will need to do an extra work and trying to understand the protocol. But if you do actually know the fly protocol, it must be quite straightforward. Okay. And we're not expecting like to have a full verifier, that, that we, but we want, you to, we, want, we want you to play with peel and maybe start with a small bar for a fry. I think it's a, a nice one. Like it's, it's quite, as itself, it's uh, quite complete, but you can, just, I, I would be perfectly fine if you just have time with, to do like some subcomponent just for you to encourage you to play with peel, play around, see our, our tool set. And I mean, if, if you have the full verifier, that would be awesome, but probably 36 hours uh, you have, you'll have to sleep. So, does that answer your question, more or less? Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Uh, you 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 gen auto generate the you auto generate your comment script from from peel or not? Yes. Okay. That's an, uh, I can. Sh so we have also put it here, but uh, I can show it to you more more in, de in detail if you want. If you want to see exactly how all the pieces that we are using to generate that, we can go through it. But in here you will you will see that there's a second there's. Basically, the first part is uh, test main. We give an appeal, we generate a, a proof and verify it. And then you can see that there's two commands here that, that generate the circum. And it, it compiles the circum. This was the first step I was mentioning before. We are generating a star verifier with custom gates and get the R1CS. And then there's this uh, second part, test proof verifier peel which it calls a verifier setup and verifier exec, which, which if you uh, take a look at it, it will go through a pill stack, which is the other repo that we have not uh, explained here, but is where there, uh, all the uh, logic that's, undergo, uh, that's uh, happening is. And you, you will, if you follow the script, you, you will find where exactly the the appeal is, comp is compiled and everything, but uh, I can help you through that. So uh, R1CS basically is GRAS16, basically, right? Plunk. Oh, uh, Plunk, okay. Because so we, we needed to convert uh, back to peel. Okay. And it was, uh, I mean, I, can we do it with... Have yeah, yeah, we do a transpilation from the R1CS description of the Circum circuit to the, let's say, to a Plunk description which is quite a straightforward because the long description is like a subset of the R1CS1. I can uh, show but, it. But, but, so, so you have a Stark verifier, you turn it into a Planck circuit, and then you run a verifier in it in, seri in so, so What is the motivation? So, like? so, and then you said Peel itself can verify a So are you, if you're familiar with Planck, yeah. 
So here you can see that uh, this uh, li lines 59, we are basically uh, probing a uh, plan constraint. And so the idea is we have this direct, direct conversion from circum to, to pill. But the, and the motivation comes from that with circum, we added custom gates, which then we are not uh, checking the constraints inside the custom gates. We're just doing the computation. So as I was explaining before, for the extended multiplication or for a Poseidon, for example, we, uh, we, uh, circum would just be saying, so here's uh, the input that I'm sending to the Poseidon and here's the output. So then we need to verify that those inputs are well connected with the Poseidon and that, that this is where PIL comes into play because what we did is we converted the, we, we trans, transpiled uh, the Plonk um, R1CS, uh, Plonk constraints, which is straightforward. And now, okay, so now we have to prove that all the custom gates that you've added are correct. And here, for example, that's what I was showing you before. Here you can see there's Poseidon gate, which basically, as I was saying, it proves that a Poseidon is um, properly executed or the extended multiplication. But this was, uh, this is the, extend, the extended multiplication. So this was way cheaper rather than uh, letting, um, that, that writing straight for in, in circum. So you are doing some kind of a recursive snark, basically, or stark. Sorry? You go a stark to snark, and then you come back to peel. No, it's, it's not. It's not an stark because we are not. We are not, uh, in fact, generating a proof of the circum. It's more about uh, expressiveness. So we, we 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 encountered that it was at the beginning it was much easier to express everything with circum with r one cs because the logic of the verifier is not. Uh, let's say it's not as, as a structure of the, as the proving part. Okay, so we have the circum description, but we do not generate a proof of the circum description. We, we transpile the set of constraints to a pill description. And then what we do is we generate a start of the pill description, okay. which is, uh, if it's well done for sure, is theoretically equivalent to the R1CS1. Okay, so we, we never do like this uh, transformation between a snark or a start. We use compute starks. I understand. Thank you. And then this goes to, recurs uh, to the recurs recursion, and if you're interested, we can, uh, we can show you how this connects with our recursive systems and how we aggregate different proofs together. But that's the main component. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So then uh, Brian will talk about the Plunky, the Plunky 3 track. Uh, my name is Brian. Uh, I'm the senior DEFRA engineer at Polygon. Sorry my voice sounds a little bit, you know, it's because I got a really bad flu. Uh, so I'm trying to protect everyone by wearing a mask. So, but don't be afraid. Come talk to me if you have questions. I'm super welcoming. I'm just hiding my smile under the mask. All right. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll just quickly go, th uh, let's take a look at this page where this bounty is. Uh, so we have three links. Uh, first is the Plonky3 repo itself. So if you wanted to go through Plonky3 repo, uh, you can do so. And then the second link is what we're going to be going through during this 30 minute session. It's a simple Fibonacci implementation in Plonky3 framework uh, or toolkit. And the third one is more advanced version of, of an example using Plonky3. So it's basically a cat cat implementation in uh, using Plonky3. So being able to generate a proof that you executed this cat cat hash correctly or not. So SHA3. Right, so this will be the repo that we're going through today. So if you don't have the link, you can scan this QR code right now. I'll just put it up here for a moment. Oops. Uh. All right, so in this sort of 30 minute session, what we're gonna be covering is what is Plonky3 and how does it work in a brief session. I'm not going to dive too deep 
and I don't even think I can explain it too well if we dive too deep. So just on the surface level, understand what this is for, why did we even build this, and what kind of solvent that we're, a problem we're solving. Uh, and then we're gonna go through a step-by-step -step process of how to write your own air scripts, and from there, how do you build out the pipeline of a ZKP system fast using Plonky3, and at last, we'll run it and then see if it works or not. All right, so what is Plonky3 and how does it work? First, let's understand Plonky3. Plonky3 is basically a toolkit that helps you create a ZK system with ease. Um, it's basically a really performant uh, PIOP uh, system, but it's also very different from some of the others where they have a very fixed design as in if you use their tool stack, if you use their toolkit, you're basically stuck with one field or one particular hash functions. But in Plonky3, it's composable as in, uh, we provide the option for you to choose the kind, uh, the kind of field that you want. It's out of five, which we have a list at the, at the very bottom of this page. Or, and, and then also you can also choose your own, I guess like hash functions that fits your program's needs. And depending on the configuration your program, uh, and your program logic, the performance might vary. And it's super easy to test out, as in uh, once you finish writing your air scripts, all you need to do to test out different fields or test out different hash functions is just changing one or two lines of code. So we abstract away a lot of the complexity when it comes to developing your own ZKP systems. All right, so if we map it into a, some, some, the product that we, we are all familiar with, let's say PyTorch or TensorFlow. It has been out there for the longest time, and we were able to build a lot of amazing AI models on top of it. So that's sort of where Plonky3 is. Plonky3 is sort of that, you know, TensorFlow or PyTorch that are a position, uh, but for ZKP system. And you can use Plonky3 to abstract away the, you know, prover or verifier, I guess, like implementation process. It's just one or two lines of code to implement. Uh, all you need to do is just focus on your application and focus on your creativity. And of course, on top of that, you can make all kinds of combinations to build a complex ZK system such as ZK VMs, like the one from Succinct Lab, SP1, or, you know, a Valida is also a really good example. Uh, or as simple, uh, or you can also build a very simple one circuit uh, sort of a, a ZKP application like this one that I'm showing, a Fibonacci sequence. So now that we kind of understand where the position is for Plonky3, it's basically what you use to build your own ZKP system fast. And how does it work, right? And what is the input that requires from user's perspective or developer's perspective? Uh, so first thing, uh, this is up to us as design, uh, de uh, developer who are using Plonky3 to develop. You need to be able to know what your program is, the, your application or whatever pro uh, computation logic is, and you need to implement that in air, air scripts. So air is sort of a constrained system or I guess like a, like a framework or a logic that is, um, that is unparalleled to R1CS. Um, you might be familiar with R1CS. Uh, Air is a little bit less structured, um, and more freedom, um, uh, which we're gonna go through in a bit. And to work with an Air, you need to be able to generate a execution trace of your program. And then on top of that, you define your air uh, sort of constraints or relations of different elements in your uh, execution trees. And I'll say from developer's perspective, these two, are, these two steps are one of the main steps that you will have to focus, spend most time in. And remaining is all configuration. We're, we'll still go through, um, but you don't have to 100% understand if you're not from the really cryptography background. So first, you need to decide on the finite field that you're gonna work with. It could be, uh, it could be Baby Bear, it could be Goldilocks, uh, it could be Mensai, uh, Mersenne 31, and more. And on top of that, uh, you need to decide on some of your 
your data structure, basically. Um, you can just understand it that way. Um, and also decide on your, uh, based on the field, there are different uh, polynomial commitment scheme that works best with the field. Uh, we have templates for it, which you don't have to memorize. You can just kind of reference it and copy paste it over to your projects. Um, and also, you know, defining your fast Fourier transformation, I guess, matrices. Um, those also comes with the template. And configure your fry configs. Um, those are, I, I think, I think Hector kind of covered a little bit. I'm uh, sorry, I, I think Roger kind of covered a little bit. It's just, if you don't know fry, maybe you can just go with a template. Uh, it's just some, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the elements that you need to, to configure. Uh, as in like how many numbers of queries, uh, stuff like that. Uh, and also we need to create this challenger sequence because uh, we have a challenge, uh, we have a prover, proof generator, and then we also have a verifier. Both will need a sequence of challenges. So we'll be using, we'll create a same sequence of challenges uh, to implement this via Shamir. <clears throat> and then of course, with all of these pre-setups that we have done, we, have, we use another one line to define, okay, this is our Stark. And then we will use it to generate proof. Uh, we also have a verifier uh, that will, you know, take the inputs, uh, take the proof and the input state and the final state and also the challenge sequence to verify whether if it's correct or not. All right, we're, we'll go through all, all of these in the code example. So don't panic, uh, but this is just a general run through of how Plonky 3 works. So this modular design really allows you know, easy customizations and optimizations for different components. Whereas you can, you know, in a lot of these examples, you can just swap this three. This is just one line of definition. You can just swap it with another a type of field and then it will still work, the whole system. And it, it makes developer really easy to test out, okay, what kind of field, what kind of hashes works best for my air script that I just defined. All right. Um, yeah, this is my advice. Uh, seems complicated, but don't panic. The, you don't have to understand all of it. All right, let's, under, let's go through the Fibonacci error example now. Now that we kind of understood what Plonky is, a uh, Plonky 3 is, and how it works in a brief level. So from developer's perspective, there are six steps that is required to build out your Plonky 3 uh, sort of a ZK system. First, uh, on the left side, there are three major steps which they are all mean, uh, they are all contributing to build your error scripts. And then on the right side is where the Plonky 3 part really shines, is configure your ZK system using Plonky 3 uh, and run it, see if it works. <clears throat> so first, define your program. In our case, will be Fibonacci, right? So we need to understand what is this computation and we need to find out what are some of the requirements of this computation. Uh, so first, we have, we have three, uh, I can think of three requirements, and if you have more, feel free to create a PR, and then I'll add on top of this. Uh, so first, every Fibonacci program start with zero and one, right? So that's like an initial state, uh, sort, of a, sort of a constraint or, or requirements that we need. And then the second constraint is, you know, on each iteration, um, the current, uh, current two inputs, um, when they transition into next state, as in like next iteration, the second element of the current two inputs will go to the first element of the second iteration. And then the sum of the current iterations uh, will become the second element of the next iteration. It's a little bit, if I describe it in words, it's a little bit whining. Uh, I should have drawn a graph, uh, but, but it's basically, you know, A, B, C, D, where B is equal to C, right, and then A plus B is equal to D, and that's sort of a, sort of a logic. <clears throat> and then the third requirement, it's also, now that uh, we're going to iterate n times of this Fibonacci sequence, then we should expect a very definite result that should match uh, just should be the exact result of, you know, after running n times of Fibonacci sequence. Uh, for instance, if it's three times, then our result should be, should be two, right? 
<clears throat> so now that we understood our programs and some of the requirements, how do we translate that into air constraints? Uh, so there are a couple of tips to be mindful of. Uh, when describing air scripts, we, uh, there are four things to be taken note of. First is define a valid state transitions from current state to the next state. And AKA, uh, what are the constraints when transitioning from current role to the second role? Um, this is how we're defining it. Of course, there are different ways of defining the structure for, 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 air, for, for, for air scripts. Like, you don't even have to make it into a matrix. You could just make it into a complete one-dimensional one vector and then access every element by bits. Um, this will complicate a lot of the topics. And for now, what we're working with is every step, every iteration means a row. And how many rows it has in this matrix means how many computation or how many iteration it has done in this matrix. So just picture that matrix in your head right now. And this valid state transition means from one role to another role, what is the relations of each element uh, from the previous role to the second role? So that's first. Second thing to be mindful of is inside this current role, this, this current role, I don't care about all the adjacent role, just my role, uh, is there any relationships or is there any constraints I should be mindful of? For instance, um, in, in, this one, in this role, uh, let's say in this current matrix uh, program, uh, there's only one element that I need to be mindful of. And I just need to check whether this element is zero or one. Then I can do something like, you know, uh, putting up a constraint like x times x minus one equals zero to, to make sure that x is only equal to zero or one, like a Boolean result. Uh, but of course, we have, in our library, we have to assert bool to check it. Uh, so just be mindful of those. In our Fibonacci program, we don't have this requirement. But <clears throat> and then the third will be, you know, check your initial state. When the program begins, does it has a very specific initial inputs or state that it should start with? And at the end, do you expect a very definite result uh, that you need to, to double check with? So these are the four things to be mindful of when you're writing your air scripts. Um, Regardless, I think this is getting a little bit more, a little bit too abstract now. So let's just dive straight into the code. Uh, if you want to read more details, I have written these. So yeah, please take your time and read it. And if you have any questions, I'll be at the booth uh, waiting for you to ask me questions. All right. So in actual code, how do you write your air circuits, and what is it that we're trying to achieve? All right. Uh, so first. Uh, how this air circuit or air constraint, it exists in Plonky3, this sort of a library, in a format of a struct, a Rust struct. And in this case, what we need to define is first a struct. It could be empty if you don't have any inputs, uh, but in our case, we need to have inputs. What are the inputs? First, we need to define how many steps are we going to iterate. As in like for this Fibonacci sequence, do I need to run it three times, four times, eight times to get the result I want? And after eight times, what is that result? I also need to check uh, if the program, if, the, if this air circuit has calculated correctly. So I also need to give them my expected final value result to check it at last. So these are the two inputs that I have defined to feed into this plonky, uh, pl uh, this air scripts. And then I'll implement some traits, right? First, uh, first trait is, uh, since we're working with a matrix, and in this very specific example, I have decided to make my matrix uh, two element uh, per row, sort of a matrix, because per iteration, I only need to check the, 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 the inputs, the two inputs, right? Whether at the beginning, it says, does it start with zero and one? And then in the next state, is it like one, one, where it has a uh, valid transition from the first iteration to the second iteration? So stuff like those. And I, I only need two elements in this case per iteration. 
So I set the, the matrix width as two. And depending on your program, this matrix width can be much wider. It can just be one. Um, it's, all, it's pretty flexible. And now that I have defined the width of the matrix, uh, let's define our constraints, all right? So the way we do this is sort of adding this sort of, uh, this eval function uh, for, for, our, for, for our air, uh, air struct. It's sort of like in AI where you have this learning rate sort of a, uh, like after, after you train the model or calculate it, you, you do this sort of a critical, uh, I, sorry, maybe I'm nervous, I kind of forgot that term, uh, but it's like at, at last you, you kind of double check it, right? Sort of evaluate it. Um, it it's sort of similar. It's, what it does is af, uh, from one state to transition to another state, or from one iteration transition into another iteration, it's going to call this eval function. And it's going to check inside, uh, check the conditions inside this. And first, let's take a look at what, it, uh, what, uh, what, I, uh, what I designed for this. So uh, this main is sort of uh, the, the variable that you use to access the current matrix uh, iteration. Uh, as in, and then by using this row slice, um, zero index, you can get the current iteration row. And by adding one index, you can get the next one. Um, so how does it know that the width is, uh, I'm, I'm getting exactly two elements per row slice, because uh, we defined it here in the width. So I have defined it as two, so per row slice, I'm going to get two elements. And I'm checking three conditions, basically. First is, it's going to check, hey, is this the very first row that we're going through? So this function will only be, uh, we only be accessed uh, when, it's, when it's reading the very first row of this matrix. And it's going to check the very first element, is it equal to zero? So if it's not, obviously it's gonna fail. Um, and also the second element for, of the first row is going to check if the value is equal to one. And you might be questioning, like, why is it so complicated? Like, A, B, expression, zero. Why not just zero? Because we're playing with fields here. They're not, like, numbers number. They're actually, you have to access the field version of the zero number. So that's why you have to use this sort of a format to access it. And same with the one. And so that means this will only be accessed one time. At the, very, at the beginning of the, the matrix access. Uh, and this will probably access every single iteration is when transitioning, when transitioning from, from this row to the next row. All right, I'm gonna check uh, whether the, the first, uh, first element of the next row, is it the same with the current row's second number? Because we're passing it, right? Uh, and the sum of the current row uh, is it equal to the second element of the next row? This is basic Fibonacci logic. And at last, um, we're gonna check. Uh, this final value, self.final value, is the input that I passed in uh, when, I, uh, when I create this uh, error constraints. So it's not calculated by the error circuits, but I calculate externally, but I pass in as for verification purpose. And then this final value will also be converted into a field expression in this line. And then I'll compare if the final, final result is the same as what we expect. If it passes, it will pass. All right, so now we have sort of completed two steps. We have completed the, we understood our program and then we have defined our air constraints now it's time to figure out the execution trace that our error constraint will be applied to. So execution trace is, if you don't know this term, uh, but I think majority of you might know already, uh, but it's basically uh, the, the footprints of your program's calculation. Uh, for instance, like if you define some sort of a, I guess like a, like a recursion algorithm, when you write in code, it would just be like one function, right? And then it doesn't matter how many times you call it, it just like, 
one, it, the, the code only appears once in your code because you're calling it uh, in the runtime uh, for X amount of time. Uh, but in the execution trace, if you call that fu recursion function five times, then that part of the code will, will appear five times. So stuff like that is, is literally the footprints of every single clock counts or program counts. Um, and it keeps track of the program states, the, the, the necessary state that is needed um, for, uh, for, get, uh, for, I guess, your application. And in our case, for Fibonacci number, it basically what we tr keep tracking of is the two input numbers in every single iteration. And we just need to define the program that, that keeps track of it. So what it does, so first, um, I need to create a, a one-dimensional vector uh, that keeps track of all the states. And it, uh, the size is basically numbers of steps because that's, that's predefined and times two because every step has two elements. Um, and then we just do a for loop. You know, uh, We define the initial state AB, which is zero and one, and then we do a for loop uh, and then keep on pushing the, the current state of the Fibonacci uh, calculation into this vector. And at last, once we fit, feed in all of these, because our, because our air constraints work with the 2V vec 2D vector, uh, uh, sorry, 2D matrix. Uh, we'll use this row major ma matrix. This is this comes with uh, the Plunky 3 library. There's like sparse matrix. There's other types of matrix that you can look into depending on your program's needs. Uh, but we'll just convert it into a 2D uh, row matrix where we can access the program by row in the, the air constraints. All right. So these are the complicated part that is sort of done. Um, the build your air circuit uh, scripts. I explained it a lot, but honestly, if you're implementing it, you'll find it's quite easy. Maybe there are a lot of edge cases that you need to spend some time to figure out, but once you figure it out, you just have to implement it. That's it. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And now let's configure your ZK system and just run it, right? Um, I'm not going to go too deep because there are tons of examples that you can just look into. But the major part is here, step four. Choose your field and hash functions. We currently support multiple fields and multiple hash functions. Uh, and how you define it is basically, you know, just this is a template. You can do how, whatever kind of format you want, uh, but this should help you debug a lot, a lot smoother. Um, so we first need to define the, the, the value type, the, the values field. And then on top of that, we also need to extend the value because you know, this value is, you know, Mersenne is 31 bit. And if we want to create a challenge on top of it, uh, we'll have to extend this a bit because 31 bit, you know, it's, it, it might be brute forceable, right? So we'll extend it. Uh, to, uh, to the level where, you know, it's a little bit uh, more challenging to, to, to brute source and it's safer, basically. Um, uh, and also, we'll, dis uh, we'll choose our hash functions. And in this case, we're choosing uh, KitKat256 hash. Um, uh, and, then, and then for the hash functions, because it, it, it is just a hash functions, we also need to, 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 to create a serializer that take, uh, reads the field elements to, uh, to feed into the hash functions. So we also need a field hash. And, and we'll just define instance of those. Um, so this is just a process of it. And if you want to take a look at what are some of the other fields and hash functions that we support, I also kind of list it at the very bottom. So more complicated example, there are also various configurations you can explore in Plonky 3. Currently, we support Goldilocks, uh, Baby Bear, Koala Bear. <laughs> I don't know what's up with all the bear, but uh, Mersen uh, 31 and then BN254. And hashes, we support Poseidon, Poseidon 2, Rescue, Monolith, KitKat, uh, Blake 3, uh, SHA2. Uh, and I think there are more coming along, so stay tuned on that. Regardless, um, so that's about it for choosing the, the field and your hashes. And once those are done, 
now we just need to write your ZK system setup. It's very, I would say it's, I would say like if I go through all of these, um, we can definitely do it, but it's not that necessary because it's just the configuration you need for create the start prover. And in the process, you need a compressor that compresses the hash results to, to keep the, the I, I guess, the result more clean, more structured, and a fixed size. Um, and then you also need a Merkle tree uh, that is required for, for I guess, like uh, the, the, the challenges uh, in, in the Fry protocol. Uh, and also, you need, uh, you, need a, you, need to, you need an extended version of the Merkle tree as well. Um, and also you need uh, the, the challenger, and all of these will be feed into this fry config uh, with some of these configurations that you can play around with. Normally I would just recommend go, go along with the configuration. Um, and then for a polynomial commitment scheme, um, the one that we're showing in this example, we're using circle PCS. There are other uh, PCS that we also support uh, depending on the field. Uh, I guess like you can choose whatever fits the best. For Mer uh, Mersin 31, uh, Circle PCS works really fast. So that's why this example is showing this. And yeah, basically all of the above steps are used to, to configure this PCS and they will be fed into start config to, to finally finish this configuration of, uh, of the start and you can st now start using it. Um, there are more examples of this I'll show in a bit, uh, but let's just quickly go to the run part, where now that we have the start proof, uh, start prover sort of configured, is ready to go, what do we do, right? We have the air scripts, uh, we have the execution trace generator, uh, we also have the, what's my call, uh, the, the, the start prover, uh, we just have to use them, right? So first, um, let's define our inputs. Uh, we are going to, in this case, we're going to run eight times for the Fibonacci sequence. And the final value that we see is 21. Uh, if you try to Google it, the, the, the end result of you know, eight iterations of Fibonacci is 21. And then this is, we're instantiating the air scripts, in this case, by giving the, uh, giving uh, these two inputs that we just defined in this struct, uh, and we'll get our air scripts. And also we need our execution trace, which will just plug the number of steps in it, and it will be able to generate this trace for us. And these two are sufficient enough for, for us to generate our proof. <clears throat> and of course, we're, we're doing Fiat Right, because we want we don't want to have ping and pong sequence all the time. Uh, we just want to create the same sequence for both prover and verifier um, at once. Uh, so we're doing exactly that. Here's the challenger, and here's the exact same challenger that we're defined. And one of them will be passed over to the proof function. One of them will be passed over to the verifier function. And for the proof function, um, this config is the start config we're passing this in. And this is the air script that we just wrote. And challenger is basically the challenge sequence. And trace is the execution trace. And here we're throwing in this empty, I kind of forgot what this was. Uh, yeah, I'll take a look. Um, but yeah, we need this empty vector. I, I think it was something similar to the C challenge. Can't remember exactly. Uh, but then, yeah, all of these will be used to generate a proof. It's just one line of code. You have your proof system um, runnable, and then you just generated your proof. And same thing for the verification process. Same, pro uh, same config, same error, same challenges, same, uh, but the proof that you generated in previous step, uh, and then you throw in, it's going to check whether if the verification works or not. And the final result should work something like this. You just hit, if you get cloned this website, uh, sorry, get cloned this repo, and then do cargo run, this is sort of the, the, the result that you're gonna get. Uh, maybe I can quickly show, right? Cargo run. It's ultra fast. Or maybe it's because it's Fibonacci. 
um, but it's fast enough, definitely. So now we're closing to the end of, oh, we're getting to the end of this workshop. Uh, I'll just quickly show another, I'll just show right here. Oh, this is another sort of an example of how to access your execution trace. So the execution trace example that I gave you guys is more of a, I guess, like picturable uh, using a matrix format where each row represents um, a current, uh, each iteration, right? But there's also another way where if you look at this format, it's basically access, accessing the states by bits. Uh, so all the, uh, in, in this example, all the, all the execution trace is in one, in one entire 1D vector, and then you're just sort of accessing uh, via, via uh, subscripts. Um, but there are a lot of other ways that you can do. It's pretty creative. Uh, it's, it's, it's just, this, this is the, the logic behind air, is it doesn't have a very strict role on these, but it only has this sort of design thinking. So you, sh you just need to apply that to your program itself. And last but not least, if you take a look at this, uh, if you go to Plonky3 and then Plonky3, Plonky3 organization, Plonky3 repo, and then go to KitKat hyphen air folder, this is the air implementation of KitKat. So basically we have implemented a KitKat hash function in air scripts. Uh, if you don't know how KitKat works, you should take a look at it before you start reading uh, this repo because it will get really complicated. And once you're in, uh, there's two folders. There's example folders and source folder. Source folder is where we have defined uh, the air scripts of this KitKat. Um, you know, this is the main function, the, the air.rs, and then it it calls all the other functions from, from these other, re, uh, other, other, fo uh, other files. So, and then with that air, air scripts defined, we have showcased all kinds of examples of the different combinations of different fields and different hash to, to calculate the air, uh, the, the KitKat hash function, uh, KitKat air scripts. And if you look into each files, they look quite similar to one another. Because, like I just said, you know, to test out different fields or to test out different hashes, it's just changes of one or two lines. And it's that simple. So, yeah, I'll say that's about it. Um, honestly, this is actually my very first time presenting Plonky3 in front of everyone. Hopefully, it was clear. Um, but if you have any questions, you know, I'll be at the sponsor's booth wearing my mask, so it should be recognizable. Uh, my name is Brian, so yeah, just come to me anytime. But if I have time, I can still pick up some questions now or... No, I think, I think we're going to wrap up. All right, cool. All right, thank you so much. Thanks, Brian. Thank you very much. <laughs>